Picture in your mind the example of a worker within a palace, serving many different people who not only have their own requirements, but their requirements are at odds with the requirements of the others. So he's called by one of them to fulfill a duty, but no sooner does he make his way to fulfill it than another calls him for a second task that conflicts with the first. So he tries to accomplish it, but soon after he's called over by a third who requests something that clashes with the previous two. Can this person ever rest in this torn state? Now think about the second example, another worker within one palace who's at the service of only one person who is kind and loving and sympathetic and generous. The tasks are doable, the, the rewards are great, and ultimately his mind and his efforts are gathered upon one. And with all of that said, to Allah belongs the greatest examples. The first example is in reference to those who worship many different gods. Each god has its own interest, its own requirements. And this god can be an idol, false god, but it can also be a business, it could be a mirror reflection, online following, a cigarette, the pursuit for fame, where each has a demand that is not only impossible to satisfy, but it contradicts with other demands as well. And as for the second example, the second analogy, it's the example of a Muslim whose obedience and worship and attention and submission is on one for Allah, the Master, whereby everything else is secondary and tertiary, fitting them around his duty to Allah, his sole ambition. And that's why when Hussein was asked by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Hussein, كم تعبد إلها اليوم؟ أو حسين، how many gods do you worship these days؟ and حسين he responded by saying I'm worshiping seven gods. six of them are on the earth and one of them he's in the heavens. Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم he asked him a remarkable question. he said to him فأيهم تعد لرغبتك ورهبتك؟ which of them do you focus on during your times of hope and fear? He said, the one in the heavens. And after this conversation, he, he knew exactly what the Prophet ﷺ was getting at. Leave the ones on the earth and single out the one in the heavens. And Hussein would embrace Islam after this conversation. The name of the Lord in the heavens who is to be singled out in hope and fear and love and reliance is the greatest name to have ever resonated within the ear of man. His name is Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So profound is this name that towards the end of time, when the very last soul of the believers would have been taken away from planet earth, leaving only the worst of cre creation on earth and the most corrupt. During that time, the name Allah will also be lifted because the name of this purity and perfection can never be left in the hands of such people. And that is why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, لَا تَقُومُ السَّاعَةُ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ يَقُولُ Allah, Allah, The hour will not come to pass upon anyone who says, Allah, Allah, Allahu Akbar. What are the origins of this perfect and majestic name, Allah? I share with you a few opinions, and I will elaborate on each of them to help transform that daily experience of hearing this majestic name, Allah. Some of the scholars, they say that the name Allah is derived from the word alaha, which means abada, worshipped. He worshipped, making Allah al-ma'luh, the one who is worshipped. And yes, everything within the heavens and the earth, whether we realize it or not, prostrates to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Almighty, He asks, أَلَمْ تَرَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَسْجُدُ لَهُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ Do you not see that to Allah prostrates whoever is in the heavens and whoever is on the earth? وَالشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ And so does the sun and so does the moon. وَالنُّجُومُ وَالْجِبَالُ 
and so do the stars, and so do the mountains, and so do the trees, and so do the moving creatures, and so do many people. La ilaha illallah. He is the one who is worshipped in the heavens and the earth, whether we realize it or not, and whether man chooses to prostrate to Allah or not, his very shadow has not consulted him and falls into prostration to Allah. Allah said, وَلِلَّهِ يَسْجُدُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ طَوْعًا وَكَرْهًا To Allah prostrates whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth willingly or by compulsion. He then said, وَظِلَالُهُمْ And so do their shadows. وَظِلَالُهُمْ بِالْغُدُوبِ وَالْأَصْرَانِ And so do their shadows in the morning and in the, and in the afternoons. He is the worshipped one in this universe. He is the one who is worshipped beyond it all. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, أَرَى مَا لَا تَرَوْنَ إِنِّي أَرَى مَا لَا تَرَوْنَ وَأَسْمَعُ مَا لَا تَسْمَعُونَ I see what you do not see and I hear what you do not hear. He said, أَطَّتِ السَّمَاءَ وَحُقَّ لَهَا أَن طَئِطْ He said, the sky is creaking. It has every right to creak. Why is the sky creaking? He said, ما فيها موضع أربع أصابع إلا وملك واضع جبهته ساجدا إلا because there isn't even the space of four fingers in the heavens except that there is an angel who has occupied that space lowering his head in prostration to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that's one meaning the one who is worshipped some scholars they say that the word Allah is derived from the root word aliha, meaning tahayyara, in reference to one being bedazzled or losing his mind as a result of extreme happiness or extreme grief. And yes, bedazzlement, amazement, and sheer awe are perfectly natural experiences in the lives of those who know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No mind can encompass his perfection. No words can capture his majesty. Allah said, وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِهِ عِلْمًا They will never encompass him in knowledge. And Allah Almighty said, لَا تُدْرِكُهُ الْأَبْصَارِ No vision can grasp him. لا إله إلا الله The one who bedazzles. Allah is the one who bedazzles those who know him in amazement and awe. Just as he bedazzles in misery those who choose to lead their lives away from him. Bedazzled in anguish swept off their feet in misery. This is the outcome of not knowing Allah, a sweeping sense of misery because our need for Him in our lives is greater than our need for food and drink and oxygen. Man cannot do without Him for even a single second of his day, even if he arrogantly claims otherwise. So this is a second meaning. Other scholars hold that the perfect name Allah is derived from the root Aliha, like the one before it we mentioned, but this time with the meaning of to seek refuge. So when you say la ilaha illallah, it means you have no escape but to Allah. That's one of the most comforting realities of life, to know that your retreat and your refuge is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because who is it who forgives sins other, other than Allah? Who amends broken hearts other than Him? who holds the cure to ill souls and bodies but him? Who can guard the believer from the chastisement and harassment of shaitan other than him? Who compensates people for lost opportunities in life other than him? He is Allah, the eternal escape for the believer. And he is the greatest refuge. This is precisely why at times Allah releases difficulties upon you to help refresh your appreciation of this majestic name, Allah, the refuge. A name that may have suffered some wear and tear in your life in the last couple of months and years. And it's at that moment of difficulty when you come to realize that every other rope in life had been cut, that the only remaining rope was that of Allah's. So you grab onto it and you beg for help like you've never done before. And you implore Him for forgiveness uh, having turned for having turned to other than him in your life. And it's at that phenomenal moment where you finally experience a brand new level of Iman and, and warmth 
and an unmatched attachment to Allah, all of which become dearer to you than the removal of the difficulty itself. And that's what Allah wanted the entire time from that difficulty He sent you. He didn't want your hardship. He simply wanted to help you renew your relationship with Him, to refresh your connection to the name Allah, to realize that He is your only true refuge. Focus on Him. Other scholars have argued that the roots of this perfect name Allah is from the word Al-Ilah, meaning Al-Ladhi Ta'lahuhu Al-Qulub, He whom hearts adore. Allahu Akbar. You see, the closer you are to a person and the longer your friendship is with this individual, the lower the level of awe usually drops to and respect. The exception to this rule is Allah. The more He is realized, the more He is adored. Also, people are loved for things they do or qualities that they may have. As for Allah, He is adored and worshipped for who He is. He is adored for His limitless mercy, His unbreakable might, His unrivaled ownership, His infinite richness, His never-ending kindness, His all-encompassing knowledge. He is adored because creation cannot do without Him. He is singled out in worship because life is death without Him. He is adored and so His servants obey Him willingly and lovingly and they resist the prohibitions again willingly and lovingly. If and when Allah is truly adored, then several matters come into effect immediately in a person's life. Automatically measure yourself against these examples. When you're in worship, your entire focus is on Him. You stand before Him, whether in Salah or Quran or any other act of worship, and you've given Him your undivided attention. What else happens when He is truly adored in your life? Well, when you find yourself alone, you seize the opportunity to call upon Him in ways which have, would have been a little bit more challenging in the public domain, because you now crave those lone moments with Allah. What else happens when Allah Almighty is truly adored in your life? When, for example, you use social media or any other public appearance of some sort, you will ensure that you never play a role in snatching away adoration or obsession from Allah to yourself. For example, you will never purposely present yourself in a seductive way. Why? Because you don't want to be the reason why hearts and eyes are taken away from Allah and redirected to yourself instead. Achieving that would depress you. It wouldn't please you. You want Allah to be glorified. You want Him to be thought of, not yourself. That's because you've experienced yourself the joy of adoring Allah and you want others to do so as well. And you hate the idea of being an obstacle in that, in that endeavor. What else happens when Allah is truly adored? Well, when disobedience takes place in front of you, your heart tears in pain and in confusion, perplexion, how Allah was not glorified, how Allah was not honored at that moment. Just as the Prophet ﷺ would feel when this would happen, when he heard a man who accidentally spoke inappropriately of Allah, the Prophet said to him, Wayhak, woe to you, atadrim Allah, do you not know what Allah is? Allahu Akbar. Sad when the limits of Allah are trampled upon, that's a sign. So the result of knowing that Allah is the adored one is a realization that you are by Allah and for Allah and to Allah. You are by Allah because the origins of existence were through Him. You are for Allah because existence is for Him. And you are to Allah because the final return will be to Him. And that's why the truest couplet of poetry that has ever been uttered by any mortal was, according to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the words of Labid. Labid who said, Ala kullu shay'in ma khalallahu batilu. Indeed, everything other than Allah is false.